and taste more and experience more Amen. the worker in your life in the name of Jesus. Amen. To share with us what the wonderful worker has for us this morning, please put your hands together Amen. as we invite Reverend Lord. Open the floodgates in abundance and cause your rain to fall on me. Baba, open the floodgates in abundance and cause your rain. Fall on me, open the floodgates in abundance and cause your rain to fall on me. Baba, open the floodgates in abundance. just a vessel and nothing more. Lord, when you are done, take all the glory. I'm just satisfied to see you, Lord, glorified. Let me take the back bench whilst you take the front bench this morning. Lord, let your word come promptly divided to bring the answers to the needs of people in the name of Jesus thy will be done let your kingdom come this morning amen this morning I, I, I don't know I carry a great burden 
But at the same time, I'm also very pregnant with the word. I need to lift the burden before I can actually give the word. I've been praying over the last few days. And I think that maybe as we enter into the time of fasting and prayer, I would like us as a church to also pray over this. There are some things that are happening and sometimes we just don't know it unless God reveals it to us. So I'm going to tell you something about Christianity and where we are at now. You know, Paul and the disciples, they sent Christianity throughout Asia Minor. So that was where Christianity actually sprang up and it began to spread. Now, anyone who knows Asia Minor now knows that that was Turkey and a part of the Middle East. Now, what do we have there now? Christianity is almost dead. And Islam has taken over all of Asia Minor now. From Asia Minor, the word then went to Europe. And Europe was the beacon of Christianity. What do we have in Europe today? Most of the churches are sold and they have become mosques. Or if not mosques, they have become discos. So the move of God in Europe then fell. And there was a move to America. And America has been holding up Christianity up to this time. But something is happening in America. In fact, I was just writing some things down about what I call scandals in the church. And just in the last few months, many of the top people that we know in America, there have been things written about them and their churches are under attack. Just in the last few months, I've seen Gateway Church that was led by Robert Morris, uh, the Potter's House led by T.D. Jakes, uh, Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas led by Tony Evans. Now there is an audio going around about Rod Parsley and the World Harvest Church. We have heard about John Gray and the Relentless Church. We've heard about Brian Houston from Australia with Hillsong and the list goes on what is happening in the church is that the devil is on the attack and the devil is trying to decapitate the church because when you target the leader of the church then the flock are led astray Now, I am not saying that pastors are saints. There is no pastor who is a saint. But one of the things that I see about the modern church is this. That we are looking to the pastors as the owners of the church. Jesus Christ said I will build my church. He did not say, I will build T.D. Jake's church. Or I will build Creflo Dollar's church. He said, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail over it. The gates of Hades is, seems, is prevailing over the churches. Because we are seeing what I call the one man type churches. Where everybody looks to the pastor and not to Jesus Christ. So it is my prayer. What is happening now? You can see a shift from America to Africa now. 
And you can see African pastors are now spreading the gospel around the world. It is Africa's turn to hold Christianity and to build it. It is my prayer that we will not lose the ball and go the way that the others have gone. Now, to it means that we need to uphold the church of Jesus Christ. And we need to uphold our pastors to be so humble as to know that they are not the church. But to give it to Jesus. This is the burden I'm carrying. I've prayed and prayed and prayed until I cannot pray anymore. And I need people. This is the burden. I'm sharing it with you. And I hope that with the blessing of the leadership, we will carry this burden and take it forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Now let me release some of my pregnancy. If we look at the word of God, let's open our Bibles to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis chapter 13. And I'm looking at verses 10 to 12. Genesis 13 and verses 10 to 12. And it reads, And Lot lifted his eyes, and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go towards Zohar. Then Lord chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. And they separated from each other. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan. And Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain. And pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. This morning I just want to thank the leadership for this opportunity to share. I don't take it for granted. Because it is the Lord that gives his word. Amen. So I just pray that God will speak through me. Amen. In the Bible, we learn something from the men and women that are recorded in the Bible. From Abraham, we learn about the value of faith in God. In fact, Abraham was called the father of faith. So we learn about the value of faith. From Joseph, we see God's providence at work. How God provided for him throughout, even when his brothers sold him. And even when he was in prison. From Job, we learn the importance of patience and faith under trial. And each of us will go through trials. But we learn to be patient and have faith in God. Amen. We need to strengthen our faith. Now, I just want to find out, what do we learn from Lot? You know, Lot is someone that the Bible did not write too much about. He came in in association with Abraham. But what do we learn from him? This morning, I want to submit that we learn decision making and the importance of making right choices. So on the basis of that, I have titled this Choices. Choices. And specifically, I'm looking at Lot's choice. And if you would allow me, I will build a thesis on that and then we will see how that will then apply to our daily lives. 
I feel more of a teaching anointing this morning. And so I'm going to go that way. Who was Lot? Lot was introduced as the nephew of Abraham who sojourned with him. Now one thing, I've, I think I've mentioned this once. Abraham was called by God and he was going somewhere. Now what happened? Lot was never called, but Lot was a nephew of Abraham. So when Abraham was going, Lot decided to go with him, right? A man who, like his uncle, Abraham, became quite wealthy. Why did Lot become wealthy? Lot became wealthy because he followed Abraham, who had the anointing of God upon his life, right? So when you see someone who has the anointing of God, what you do is you also tie yourself to that person. Perchance, the anointing will rub off on you. And that was what Lot did. So he followed Abraham. He wasn't called, but when Abraham was going, he went. And because God had called Abraham, anybody who associated themselves with Abraham was also blessed by association. So he followed his uncle. And because of the combined wealth of both of them, they were forced to separate at some stage. That is what the Bible tells us. Now, Lot was then given the opportunity to choose where he could go. Now, he made a choice which on the surface seemed very good. Of course, as human beings, if we are given that same choice, I am sure a lot of us will do the same thing that Lot did. Because when they got to the place and they looked at the land, Lot looked at the land and he saw a land that was very flat and which was very fertile from his view. So he decided that he would choose that land, the plain land. And the funny thing is, the person who was called by God, Lot left him with the land that was not looking very good. How many of us have seen that? You help somebody, whether in your office or at home or wherever you are. And then when they come in, they take over from you. Everything that you have built. I've, I've heard of cases in Ghana. Somebody builds a house and puts uh, somebody there to hold the place temporarily for them. And then one day you hear there is a court case. The person says the land or the house belongs to them. Lot saw what he thought was good. But the Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto man. But the end thereof. So it seemed good to him, he took it. Nevertheless, as good as it seemed to him and his choice, that brought much sorrow and hardship for him. So don't think what you see is what God wants. The result of Lot's choice, and I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. I have the Bible verses there, so please you can write them down and take some time to read it when you have the time. But because of that choice that Lot made, he suffered war. This is found in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 11. Lot suffered kidnapping. Genesis 14, 12. He suffered oppression and torment by the citizens of Sodom. Genesis 19, 1 to 11 and 2 Peter 2, 7 to 8. He suffered a loss of his material wealth. Genesis 19, 15 to 16 and then 24 to 25. 
He suffered the death of his wife, Genesis 19, 17, and 26. He suffered the shame of incest with his daughters, Genesis 19, 30 to 36. Now, all this happened even though the Bible says Lot was a righteous person. So, you may think you are righteous. Does that mean that you will not suffer things in this life? You know, when I was born again, I thought that this born again thing, when you are born again, then all your problems are gone. Little did I know that being born again was actually the beginning of your problems. But though it is the beginning of your problems, like I said the last time, every time that you are able to overcome these problems, God smiles on you. So this is what Lot did. Now, I'm sure some of you may be asking me, but why are you telling us about Lot? That was long ago. What has that got to do with me? Next slide. How does this apply to me? My choices. What choices do we have to make that greatly affect our lives? I want to submit that the most important choice that we can make is the choice to accept Jesus as our Savior. That's the most important. Number one. Number one in our lives. The choice of salvation. And a lot of us have never really thought through that as the number one choice. This morning, I'm exhorting you that if you have never made that choice, I plead with you to make Jesus number one in your life. I don't know how long we have on this earth. But the day is coming when we will have to account for our life on this earth. Where will you be? In fact, I went to a church and I I decided to try something. I said to them, guys, anybody who is very, very sure, very, very sure, that if they die tomorrow, they will go to heaven, they should rise up. And surprisingly, everybody was sitting down, including the pastor. Why? Because they are not sure. But God has given us an assurance. If only we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, to them that believed on his name, to them gave he power to become sons of God. That's the most important choice that you would ever have to make. So, choosing Jesus, salvation, that's the most important. But close enough to that, is choosing the church that you will go to. These days, there are so many churches. And each one has whatever name. You can start naming them and you will never finish. But when you look at it, you will find these churches are led by characters. I call them characters. I do not call them pastors of Jesus Christ. Some of them are just doing magic in church. And because our people lack knowledge, they go chasing signs and wonders. Signs and wonders, that's not why God set up the church. He said signs and wonders shall follow The teaching of the word. 
So if you go to a church just because they say there is signs and wonders happening, my friend, I submit that you are lost. Go because of doctrine. The place is quiet. I know I'm talking to people. Another choice that we make is choosing your career. Some of us had many opportunities and we chose to go down a particular path. That path can be, it can lead you to success or it can lead you to failure. It is important in making your choices. Another choice that we make is choosing your mate or your spouse. Right? I've had many people preach about, oh, what God has put together, let no one put asunder. How do you know God put it together? I've seen many people in, in Ghana now, the youth, they meet and then this, this one, these days they have their own lingo, their language that they speak. So one sees the other and says, ah, Charlie, uh, today I feel you. Pow. The lady also says, ah, me too, I feel you. They've signed a pact. They're going to get married. Based on feelings. And then after that, they come and stand there and say what God has put together. God did not put any of that together. We choose the people that we think are good for us. You ask any woman here, uh, what, what is your speck of a man? And they will tell you, oh, you know, tall, dark, handsome, so if you are taking all the handsome men, who will take the ugly ones? <laughs> but sometimes the ugly ones are the best. But when you find that out, it is too late. When Isaac was going to marry. His father sent a servant to go and seek God. The servant went, and I'm not saying we should do this at this time, but the servant went and he got to a, a well and he was listening to God. So God, in, in his prayer, he said, God, let the woman who comes here and who gives me water and also waters the camels that I have, right? Let that person be the one. And so he waited on God. And then this woman came and she gave him water and also gave water for the camels. Now, when you think about it, it's just written. But do you know how much water one camel drinks? Gallons of water. So for her to actually give the camels water, they didn't say one camel. Camels water. Think about how much work that involved. But then God fulfilled the prayer of the one who was sent, the servant. How many of us prayed to God about the spouse before they chose the person? I know a lot of people, they come to you and they say, oh, I've chosen this one, bless it. And that's what we do to God. We go to God and we say, God, this is the one I've chosen. So you bless it for me. And then you are blessed in the church. And then in years down the track, when the problems come, then you start quoting God. But God, you said what you have put together, no one 
Well, God never put it together in the first place. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Dealing with friends, choosing your friends. Who are your friends? In Ghana, we say, show me your friend and I'll tell you your character. There are some friends who will stick by you no matter what. And there are some friends who are what I call fair weather friends. When the weather is fair, they are with you. But when the trouble hits, they're gone. They're gone. Am I teaching? I remember many years ago, I had a friend, and in Ghana at that time, we had this problem of curfew. Those were the cool days. So we were driving, and we got to a place which is around the independent square of Ghana. And unfortunately, we were caught in the curfew. There were three of us. So when we got there, the car that we were driving is a car, they call it Simca. I don't know if anyone has ever heard of it. Very small car. So we got there and the soldiers stopped us. So the minute that the soldiers stopped us, I was sitting next to the driver and then the third guy was at the back. So immediately they stopped us. He got out of the car and started walking as if he didn't know us at all. And the thing that he said, he just hit the car. Hey, same car. I didn't know you could travel like this. And then he just walked off into the darkness and he was gone. Left the two of us to be beaten up by the soldiers. Is that a friend? Which friend, when you are in trouble, when your marriage is in trouble, will they come and hold you and give you a shoulder to cry on? Will they uphold you with prayer when trouble hits? Choose your friends wisely. Dealing with choices made by past generations. I said that I'm, I'm a bit pregnant about some of these things. Past generations. Sometimes our mothers and our fathers, they did things that we don't even know about. And we are innocent. And yet, these sins are visited unto the third and the fourth generations. There was one day I was doing deliverance for a lady. And the way she came out, it was as if she was a fish. So she was lying there and doing the impressions of a fish. So when we finished, the guy who was with me was asking me, ah, Pastor Lord, we know that God delivers, but this one was tough. Why? And I said to her, Madam, come. I want you to go and do something. Okay? I want you to go and ask your mother the circumstances under which you were born. So she went, and the mother told her that at some stage she couldn't bear any child. So she went to see a fetish priest who represented a river in their village. So the fetish priest then did some things for her, and then the mother conceived and had her. But part of the agreement was that she was going to be given to the priest. And she didn't know any of this. But in her life, what was happening, every time that she tried to get married to somebody, either the person would die or the person would just get up and walk away without anything. So when the mother told her that, she came and I said, look, I know that we can pray about this and we can break it. 
But before we do that, I want you to do something. And I'm, I'm going to explain why. I said, your mother actually went and signed a pact with the devil. Right? Now, the devil is demanding what rightfully belongs to him. And he is going to adjust God and say, but God, you, why would you stop something that is legally mine? So I said to her, you tell your mother to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. The things that they said she should give to them, she should just buy it. Go to that fetish priest and dump it with him. Even if he doesn't accept it, just dump it and come back and let's pray. Which was what we did. And after that, this woman got married and she has two kids as we speak. She didn't know the generational things that had happened in her family that was affecting her. There are a lot of us like that. And that's why we go around trying to find pastors who can help us. I'm sorry, the only one who can help you is Jesus Christ. One of the other things that we need to know is choosing where you will live. Where you live. This was where Lot made his fatal mistake. Lot decided to live in the plains. And those plains was Sodom and Gomorrah. So in that place, he was influenced by the practices of the people who were around him. And that is what brought about a lot of the problems that Lot faced. He chose the best place, according to him. But was it the best? If you choose to live in Sodom and Gomorrah, sometimes it is you who will be affected. But there are times it is not you. It is your children and their children. Why? Because you chose to live in Sodom and Gomorrah. I know a friend whose house was in a very, very nice place. But opposite that house, someone came and constructed this, we call it a kiosk. And he was selling the local gin. Uh, in Ghana, we call it akpeteshi. Uh -huh. Right? So that's what the guy was selling. And people were patronizing, patronizing, patronizing. So one day I went to the guy's place and I told him, you know something, this place, I'm not so happy. He said, oh, but I was here before they came. And you know what I said to him? I said to him, be careful. He left it. After a number of years, number of years, the guy now comes to me and he says, you know something? My son has taken to alcohol. Right? And I said to him, I told you that, that place. He said, ah, but I mean, how could that happen? I said, look, I don't want to, I don't want to, give fear to you but demons have territory they take territories so his son had taken to alcohol how can he take him out so we started praying we prayed and prayed and prayed one day we got up and the Akwetashi kiosk had been it just set itself on fire and it was destroyed the owner could not replace it 
But I told him, you could have spared yourself and your family all of this if you had chosen the right place to start with. Be careful about where you live. The place that you choose to live. Would it affect you? Would it influence you? Would it influence your family? How does this apply to me? Ask yourself how you can most likely make the right choice. The book of James, chapter 1 and verse 5 to 8 tells us that we should ask God for wisdom. In everything that we do, ask God for wisdom. Don't think that you can do things by yourself. Because by yourself, you will choose the wrong things. But ask God for wisdom. Number two, I would say seek advice from mature Christians and the Bible. Go to the Bible. Find out which part of the Bible relates to the issue that I'm facing now. The choice that I'm making. In fact, I find the book of Proverbs to be a very good source of wisdom. Am I teaching? Seek advice from mature Christians and the Bible. Number three, I would say, determine how you choose to react to offenses. How do you react when someone offends you? Do you want to kill them? Do you want to retaliate? I dare say to you, when you choose to take things into your own hands, God will relax. When you give it to God, he will go to work on your behalf. A lot of us react because we are human beings and we want to attack the person. Now, let me do this. So, what do you do if you have already made the choice? If you have already made the choice, the first thing you need to do is to repent of that choice and ask God for his forgiveness that you did not go to him in the first place. It's better late than never. And God in his infinite mercy will have mercy upon you and change the circumstances for you. Don't stay in that sinful choice that you have made. That's not an option. And the last thing that I will say, because I'm mindful of time, but I'll, I'll talk about this, is whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Whatever you do. So what do you do? Do what Lot did and heed the word of God. The word of God told Lot, flee from Sodom and Gomorrah. Are we fleeing from the things that are sent to destroy us? Or are we still living in Sodom and Gomorrah? Number two, do what is right without reservation. Remember Lot's wife? She was told not to turn around, and she did turn around. She hesitated. Do what Peter did after denying Jesus. Repent if there is sin involved in the choice. And resolve to serve the Lord. Do what Paul did after persecuting the church. Accept the forgiveness that Jesus Christ provides. And determine to live for the Lord the rest of your life to the best of your ability, the Holy Spirit being your help. Whatever you do, do not continue in that choice. 
The next time you have to make a choice, remember Lot and the decision that he made, a critical decision. Seek to make that decision based upon the will of God and not your own. Your eternal destiny may rest upon that choice. May the Lord add his blessing to the preaching of his word. Amen.